Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Live from the Govardhan Echo Village in beautiful Maharashtra, India, this is Wisdom of the Sages, your daily yoga podcast. I'm your host, Raghunath, here with Kostuba Prabhu, old friend, dear friend, and we are studying 18,000 verses of the Srimad Bhagavatam, not all in one sitting. Just this class, we do this an hour a day. We made a commitment to do this an hour a day as much as we possibly can. The only time I don't do is if I'm traveling and I get caught up in some weird time zone, we're just not going to work. But even then, we tried to throw it in at different times. Yep. Um, so welcome aboard. If you're listening to an Apple podcast or on YouTube, you can find us. If you'd like to join us live, we have a whole group today. We've got about 55 people listening on Zoom. These are our regular students. They have the ability to write in and on chat board to look at each other, to smile. It's sort of like the Brady Bunch grid when you <laughs> right. know what I'm talking about there. But a big one. Europeans, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's a show we grew up with. It was our food as children, the Brady Bunch. So this is what the grid is like. Or the there. Hollywood can, Squares. The Hollywood Squares, yes. <laughs> Dating ourselves. <laughs> Mika Stu's been in this game for about 30-something years. I just turned 54 yesterday. Didn't want to mention my birthday again, but <laughs> apparently some of you didn't get the memo because I thought I was going to come back to boxes of presents, and it just didn't happen. <laughs> but check this out. My wisdom of the sages. How cool is this? I put my phone in it. See? Isn't that beautiful? How do you do that? Anyway. Yeah, I thought that was cool. I guess you can't see that on Apple Podcasts, but I got a Wisdom of the Sages phone cover. Um, yeah, so the Srimad Bhagavatam, um, it is... half of 108. What's that? It was just mentioned, Mohan mentioned, 54 is half of 108. What was 54? That's your 54 oh, years old. Oh, my age is 54, duh. <laughs> 54 is half 108. And I'm going to be 54. So you might say, so you might say I'm in my uh, midlife right now. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to be 54... Relatively soon. Yeah, January 31st. We're going to celebrate it in Vrindavan, actually. Yeah. And we'll have, a, gonna... we'll have a 108 thing going on at that point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know what's funny about it? We, we talk about midlife crisis like it's 40 years old, your midlife, or 45 years old. The fact is, how many men are living until 80 yeah. or 90? Midlife crisis probably like 35. What do you think of that, Kostuba? Well, that, I guess that would be the mid of midlife, right? The mid of, middle of midlife. If yeah. you're going to have a midlife crisis, you might as well get a jump on it, people. <laughs> <laughs> because old age is, is just a stone's throw away. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> this is your cheery morning program. Anyway, we touch these deep philosophical concepts that are sort of like neglected in secular society, like our, our position in space as grains of sand. Now, the beauty when you study Bhagavatam or a lot of these ancient literatures is we get caught up in little things like my pimple on my nose or my big problems like, uh, where am I going to do my yoga retreat? Uh, Costa Rica or Nicaragua? Oh, my God. <laughs> this is what I'm freaking out about. When we see ourselves in perspective of reality, I'm a tiny speck in Maharashtra. Maharashtra is, one is state, a tiny speck. Right? Maharashtra is a tiny speck in India, right? India is a tiny speck in the globe, right? Our universe is a tiny speck. Right? There's some sun that's like 30 times bigger than our sun. Our galaxy is You want me to get all space on you? I okay. can. Yeah. I'm not going to. Okay. <laughs> but the fact is we're tiny little beings. That doesn't mean we're worthless. We are very worthy. We are worthy because we're spiritual beings. You don't have to earn your worth. You don't have to purchase your worth. You don't have to have great legs to have your worth or great hair. Your worth is from your birth. birth. That's our little hashtag on the show. Your worth comes from just being born. Why? Because we're spiritual beings. The Bhagavatam reminds us of our real identity, right? And what it does is it, it, it blows away the bad odor of religion. Like that one? Bad odor of religion. The bad odor of religion. Okay. I didn't make it up. I was Frederick That's Nietzsche. That's religion B.O. Frederick B. Nietzsche. Right. Religion B.O. <laughs> religion B.O. <laughs> Hashtag that one, Lindsay. <laughs> Lindsay Scott's here. She's our scribe. 
and Mara, our executive producer, and Tom is our co-executive producer here today, too. Uh-oh, it, I just got this warning that says your internet... Okay, anyway. Don't worry about it. Just go keep on. going. So Can't anyway, um, the Bhagavatam reminds us of, us of our worth. Even though you're tiny, we have worth. Isn't that great news? And we don't have to prove it to somebody. Huh? Uh, the, the thing is, we're just not the center. We have worth. But we're just not the center of the universe. And we tend to vacillate between those things. I'm the greatest. I'm the lowest. Stop the self-loathing. It's a dis of God. It's a dis of grace. It's, it's a, a disgrace. disgrace. <laughs> that, thank you very much. It's a dis on grace. So we don't beat ourselves up. It's not a spiritual thing to beat yourself up. We appreciate ourselves. We're a spiritual being. And guess what you can do to get some worth? You can do worthy things. That's what's called dharma, the yogis call. Do worthy, you want self-worth? Lacking self-worth? I can help you. Do worthy things. You know where I got that from? The Bhagavatam. Not from me. I'm not that bright. <laughs> Why are you laughing at that? <laughs> 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 right. we want self-worth we want uh what's the word um why does it drive me crazy when Mar Mar Mara knits during the show <laughs> i she's have no idea why they're in, really enjoying it knitting <laughs> and i just feel like she's not on task like she's not ready to put fires out she's ready she is yeah. all right there's no fire that's ever burned that she wasn't right on top of it okay all right Mara. you may continue knitting <laughs> I don't know. I think if this was like Fox News and the executive producer was knitting, she'd be like right out of there real quick. Thankfully, we're not Fox News. <laughs> well, anyway, so we are cruising through 18,000 verses. And um, the Bhagavatam itself recommends reading on a regular basis, reading on a regular basis. And that's how it sticks. That's how it becomes part. We don't just read this stuff in a teacher training. That stuff you'll learn for a few days and you'll forget about it quick, right? If you've done a teacher training out there, you know what I'm talking about. You study a few verses from the Yoga Sutras, makes a little sense, have a deep realization, and then right back to regular life. Mm. To really make this stuff sink in, you've got to hear it on a regular basis, and it starts to chip away on the bad thinking that's going on in the brain. We've been programmed for some, I call it stinking thinking. You've been programmed for some stinking thinking. Uh, bad, bad uh, theories on life. And the biggest theory, which it really propounds, is you're not the body. You're not a boy. You're not a girl. Right? You're not even a human. Right? Remember high school? Kids would say, hey, man, we're just humans, man. <laughs> That's how guys talk, ladies. Let, let, you a little, let you into man talk behind closed doors, locker room. Hey, guys, we're only human. Watch out for a guy who says we're only human. They're about to do something really gross. <laughs> and you know, when I hear them do something grosser, they say things like, hey, man, we're only animals. <laughs> Guess what? You become what you call yourself. You become what you call yourself. You start to, what is going on? There's an echo in here. You become what you call yourself. Careful what you call yourself. Can you throw your phone come right back window, at you. please? <laughs> <laughs> That's why you shouldn't be knitting, Mara. <laughs> you should be all over that with a cone of silence or something. <laughs> you know what I do if a guy comes up to me and says we're just animals? You, you get away from him. I bite them. I bite them and I run in the woods. <laughs> I bite them, scratch them, and I run in the woods. We are winding up uh, chapter two. And, uh, uh, and, and, and what were you saying about this verse, the importance of this verse? Well, by the way, as you, if you're new to this podcast, you'll start to realize that Kostuba is the brighter one of the two. I look at two. It's true. It's we all true. need teachers in our life. I consider Kostuba a peer, but a peer guru to me. Hmm. You can have peers that are gurus to you. Do you know that? And it's nicer to see your peers almost as teachers. You have a lot to learn. So I just, when I'm around him, generally I sit and shut up, except once we get live. And I start talking over him, cutting him off. <laughs> no. <laughs> he seems to enjoy it. <laughs> no, I see you the same way, Rabu. I have so much I learned from you. He's just saying that. I'm really not. Okay, Prabhu. Well, 
So you want to talk, let's talk about that. Oh, my daughter just got online. I love her. <laughs> oh, he said, you, you are the louder of the two. Okay. Oh, he's, she sent that privately. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Your daughter sent you that? My daughter just sent that to me privately. I'm the louder of the two. From the yeah. mouths of babes. Okay. <laughs> From the mouths of babes. <laughs> yes, both mics that close makes an echo. Okay. I don't know what's going on. That wasn't the mic. It was the other thing. Okay. Kostuba, I want to explain yes. this last verse and its significance. Or should, wait a second, we got to do our mantra. <laughs> okay. All right, before we start this, Kostuba, why don't you do the mantras today? Because I've been doing a lot of talking already. Narayanam namaskrityam naram chaiva narotamam devim sarasvatim vyasam tato jayam mudiraye. Before reciting this stream in Bhagavatam, which is the very means of conquest, I want you to offer respectful obeisances unto the personality of Godhead, Narayana. And unto Narnarayana Rishi, the supermost human being, unto Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and unto Srila Vyasadeva, the author. Nasta Prayeshvabhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevya Bhagavati Uttamashloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtiki. By regular attendance in the classes on the Bhagavatam and by rendering of service to the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely destroyed. And loving service unto the personality of Godhead, who is praised with transcendental songs, is established as an irrevocable fact. I love that statement. It's established as an irrevocable fact. <laughs> if you have um, a sacred verse on your phone and you slide it across the floor, is that an offense? <laughs> I was sliding it across the floor. I'm like, I'm sliding the Bible time across the floor. That can't be good. Well, you know, there is that, um, I mean, for service. For service, you may sometimes, slide. Sometimes. Is that the hashtag today? <laughs> <laughs> For service. <laughs> but it is a slippery slope. We try not to put sacred books on the floor, <laughs> FYI. If, you're, if you never Good heard that, we don't yeah. keep them on the floor. Why? They're an extension. All learning is an extension of Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning. And if you do, you go like this. You put it to your head. Okay. Also, uh, what did I miss about that? About what? That's good. Okay. Okay, please explain that verse, Kostuba. Well, we're, we were on the, I think we're about to read the last verse of the second chapter. And the first chapter, questions were put forward by the sages. And quite a few of those questions were answered in this chapter. And in this last verse, it's going to answer one of the questions that came up in, um, I think it was in the first chapter, 12th text, wherein the sages asked, why did the Lord appear in the womb of Devaki, his mother? Um, as the son of Vasudeva. Why did he do that? And this verse is going to answer that question. All right. So I'm going to read. This is text 34. Thus, the Lord of the universe maintains all planets inhabited by demigods, men, and lower animals, assuming the roles of incarnations. He performs pastimes due to reclaim those in the mode of pure goodness. So there's the answer. To reclaim those in the mode of pure goodness. If you're unfamiliar with a demigod, demigod is just like us, except they have a better job than you. They have a longer lifespan than you. They have more powers than you. They're higher beings that have something to do with uh, the workings of the universe. They got responsibilities. Yeah, we got responsibility. In one sense, you're a demigod to an ant, don't you think? You can wreck the ant house. What's, what's an ant's house called? Ant hill. Uh -huh. You can wreck an ant hill. You're like a big force that it can't even perceive. You know, we talk about demigods. It gets super confusing. You're like, well, I don't believe in Yamaraj. I don't believe in Ganesh. I mean, I like Ganesh. I think he's pretty. I, like, I got, you know, I've, I've got a tattoo of Ganesh, but I don't really believe he's real. How do you know? How do you know? The yogis say you don't know just just say could be. You don't know. For you to say you don't know is just as arrogant as the ant saying, there's no one greater than me. Right? Yes. What is going on outside? They're taking care of the cows. Oh, they're taking care of the, Oh, isn't that sweet? Yeah. They're singing, taking care of the cows. And I got offended. Isn't that sad? <laughs> People are happy taking care of cows and I'm offended. <laughs> what does that say about me? It's okay. You got, you're, you're past it now. Anyway, think about those anthills. You kick down an anthill, you step on it, you crush it, they're running for their lives. You are some inconceivable force. Or sometimes I mean, an ant goes right across your plate, you're having a picnic and you're like, you blow on it. You blow that ant away. 
And the ant is like, you are a cyclone. You are a hurricane. Do you understand? That's what you are. You spit up, you, you dribbled on them while you, while you blew on them. There's water coming down, strong wind, and you're a person. The ant has no clue of that. He just feels fear, danger, danger wind thing. But it's not danger wind thing. It's you blowing. There's a person. There's a person, right? Interesting, isn't it? How do we know? We are ants. We have no perception of what's out there. And we, 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 don't worry, we have meteorologists. They'll figure it out. Are you sure? <laughs> the, the ants have meteorologists too. Do they? They can't figure it out. Okay. <laughs> yeah, one ant is the meteorologist out of, out of the whole colony. What is it called? He's an ant meteorologist. They're and they're, trying, they're going ants? to him. They're like, what is that wind coming from? And they're like, oh, it's just wind. It's, a, it's, it's when the heat goes with the cold and they clash together and it creates this cyclone effect. But there's nothing beyond us. But there's nothing beyond that. What is there, what is there beyond us? We're the pinnacle of evolution. Mm. Look at us. Look how orderly we are. Look at the intricate uh, creations we build. Isn't it interesting how steeped in arrogance we are? Laden even. Laden and steeped in arrogance. Thank you. If you're real, and, 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 and I think, and tell me if I'm wrong here, people, I think we get more arrogant by living in the cities. Because oh, no in question. cities, you see what man has created. But everybody, you know, when the people come to Super Soul, the first thing, our, our farm back home, they come over, they get out of the car, and they see the stars. You yep. don't see stars in New York City. You see the stars here, and you're just in a little bit of awe. Or sometimes a lot of people live by the sea, and it makes you realize you're insignificance when you see the ocean, right? Or you go to a forest and you're just overwhelmed by the scent of the, uh, and the beauty and of creation that's got nothing to do with the stones that you've stacked. I think being connected to nature is the first step. It's the dawn of spiritual realization. That's my statement. Well, the second canto is gonna go there actually and describe seeing nature and, and, and trying to, it's, it's, a, it's giving, and this is also in Bhagavad Gita. Much of the Bhagavad Gita is Krishna saying, when you see nature, try to conceive of me being behind it. Krishna is telling Arjuna, the light of the sun, the light of the moon, the taste of water, he's gonna name mountains, the oceans, and so on. If, if you guys wanna check that out, that's big, what is it? Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita 7-7. Seven, seven, yeah, 7-7 seven, seven, seven through well, the next. Just past 7-7. Seven, seven, yeah, but 7-8 seven, 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 eight, eight is you, the first one. 7-8 yeah. through the first, the next eight verses or yeah, so. Yeah. How you can understand higher power through material nature. How, how, and then as we advance, we can, we can perceive it. You know, there's certain, just like if we look out the window, we might see trees blowing, but we don't actually see the wind, right? but we can put two and two together. Mm. And the fact that we don't put two and two together when we see nature, the fact that we don't put together that there's a person behind this, that there's intelligence behind this, it means we've really gotten warped. You know, like you're saying, living in the cities, being disconnected um, and being arrogant, that we try to justify or we try to rationalize, we try to establish that we are independent, that whatever we get, we get by our own effort that there's no higher power than us. A self-made man. Self-made man. We it's might such think. an illusion, isn't it? It's a, it's, a, it's a very deep illusion that doesn't make a lot of sense. And often it's presented in the name of science, but it's really like there's, it, it assumes so much, which science isn't supposed to do. So there's faith on both ends. Where are we gonna put our faith? That's really the question. It's not a question of, do I operate based on faith or do I operate based on science? It's really a question of where do I place my faith? Today's modern science is their modern religion. It, it, often it is. Often it's approached in a fanatic Guess way. Guesswork taught as fact. Don't talk back. Blind faith in their decisions. Yeah. These world shelter lyrics. Oh. This one. Okay. <laughs> Should I read it? No. Uh, yes. And, and so the answer yeah. was, why does the Lord, why does Lord Vishnu come? And or why does Krishna come? and take birth in the womb of Devaki. Yes, and the answer why? is, he comes to reclaim those in the mode of pure goodness. He claims that, to, he claim, wow. That, that when one's in the mode of pure goodness, it means that they have no ulterior motive anymore. They're not coming for material things, but they're coming with the pure motive. And, and it's that pure motive 
that um, when, 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 when one approaches the divine or approaches the supreme with that pure motive, then they can understand so much more. And these past times of Krishna, now Bhagavatam is going to, there's so much information there, but that 10th canto, that huge part of the Bhagavatam that tells of all Krishna's life, those past times that he displays, they're meant to capture our attention, capture our imagination, capture our heart ultimately. And so we're going to hear about that in the 10th canto and, and coming up in the next verses, in the next chapter, we're going to hear about a very briefly, a, a run through of all the different avatars of Krishna or Vishnu. And then, um, and, and then almost like a prelude to so much more that we'll be hearing throughout the 18,000 verses. I like this concept of we are being rec reclaimed, reclaimed as if we are owned, mm -hmm. right? We, are, we thought we were independent, but we, and, and we are being reclaimed. And the idea behind all this is there is a benevolent, benevolent, loving energy tapping you on the shoulder. You ever get this feeling? I mean, we get it on our computer, time to upgrade, time to download the new software. To, and what do we generally press? Uh, remind me later. Uh, remind me later. Uh, never see this message again. <laughs> there is a benevolent force is asking us on a regular basis, time to upgrade. We want to upgrade our, uh, our con sense control, the control our, our, our diet, our thoughts, our health. There's a in, it's not that we were just programmed that way due to culture. It is inherent. The super soul or the second or a, a, a portion of Vishnu is inside of every living being. Giving advice, giving advice. The problem is I don't want to hear advice. Yeah. I have my own agenda. I have a material agenda. And sometimes it goes against the divine will. And that's when there's frustration. Yeah. So, uh, this commentary, I isn't think, it great? Whenever I come to a dead end, cause Stu just picks it back up. <laughs> this commentary, I think you will find one of those. I was just saying that moments, hmm? you know, those statements where you say, I was just saying that. I was just saying that. I say that once. Check once out the class. commentary. Bro. Let's okay, read a right. little bit. Here's the commentary. I lost my chumpak flower. Ever have chumpak incense is what a chumpak flower looks like people. You can't see it if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. Can't smell it either. You can smell it. No, you can't smell it. No. You can't smell it. By the way, Zoom people, if you're listening on Zoom, oh yeah, this isn't the law, but it's really good if I can <laughs> see your face and you're actively moving around. If it just says like iPhone S3 or something like that. It's not or, the same. It's just not the same. Even a photo of you. We like to see you in, in action unless- uh, It's terribly know, embarrassing. Unless it's terribly embarrassing. <laughs> You like to see, a, yeah, you just, you know, you want me to be alive. You got to be a little alive yourself. There you go. You give a head, Bob. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So here's the purport. There are innumerable material universes. And in each and every universe, there are innumerable planets inhabited by different grades of living entities in different modes of nature or different gunas. Vishnu incarnates himself into each and every one of them in each and every type of living society. I was just saying that. He manifests. There's certain things I just say every show. That's one of them. He manifests his transcendental pastimes amongst them just to create the desire to go back to Godhead. Godhead means outside of the material universe. It's just, a, it, 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 it's Prabhupada's translation of say, a spiritual realm. There are higher planets, like what, what we, a Judeo-Christian Judeo -Christian culture would call heaven. And then there's lower planets or pl planets or more painful, yeah. what a Judeo-Christian culture would call hell. And then there's planets somewhere in between, what we would call earth. And there's a lot of other planets like earth. And what is earth? It's a medley of both. A medley. Have, isn't it a medley of both? Mm -hmm. has, an, any, has anybody experienced like heaven on earth? Good times, birth of a child, <laughs> falling in love, the perfect vacation. <laughs> Has anybody raise your hand or say Harry Ball if you've experienced hell on earth? Oh, <laughs> is the matter with these people? What? No, just kidding. Yeah, we've all got our hearts broken. We've been uh, maybe mm. cheated on, or someone we love dies. We've got some chronic disease, or we lost a limb, or. I'm just looking for tragedies here. <laughs> but whatever it is, we've experienced some type of hell. Sometimes you experience heaven and hell in the same day. That's called the earthly planet. And uh, some philosophers break it down into the material universe as these three 
planetary systems. Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam does. You know, they also break it down. Some other philosophers break it into 14, but it's basically- Planetary the, systems. Yeah. Within three different dimensions, areas, dimensions yeah. you would say. Yeah. And uh, it's, the Bhagavatam's got to go into it. So there's lots of earthly, earthly planets mm-hmm. that you can visit. Earthly realm. Earthly realms. Yeah. And then outside of that is a transcendental place. And when, the, when Buddhists or Hindus talk about ending samsara, that's where you go. You go out of this material realm. The samsara means you die, you take birth, and you do all this stuff again. You know, fall in love, have some kids, get sick, die. And it continues How's in it different species of life. What, huh? What's the pattern again? Well, I, I mean, that was the brief pattern. <laughs> fall in love, maybe get your heart broken, maybe fall in love with someone else. Uh, um, it's, Get a disease. Get a couple kids, get some disease, <laughs> wilt, wilt, and die. We wilt first. Uh, I'm, I'm wilting right now. I've started to notice. Every time I look in the mirror, I was like, you are wilting, sir. <laughs> that's Sad, right. but I'm wilting. It's at that stage. <laughs> You're doing all right, Roger. I mean... <laughs> You're doing all right. You know, in, the, in the, a lot of these uh, Krishna books put out the, by the BBT, they have this phases of life, how the soul goes from childhood to youth. Fascinates people. It's a cool thing. It's the like idea that, the, not that we have a soul, but we are a soul, and the soul is always changing bodies. This is, a, this is like an yes. underlying principle of all Vedic teachings. And our activities in this life give us a new body. If I'm fit, if I'm strong, if I'm health, I make good choices, you know, my body will look better tomorrow. If I make bad choice, body will look worse. But the fact is, you can't stop the aging process. It's an insurmountable force. So the soul is going from this little child, this little infant, into a, a, a youth body, into a teenage body, into your 20s, in your 30s, and we're changing bodies. Sometimes they even make dioramas. Ever see the diorama yes. of it? And I always like to think I'm younger than I am in that diorama. Like, that's probably me. And my kids were like, no, that's not you. <laughs> You're the shorter guy with the mustache, the belly, with his arms folded. That's me. I've got to that next stage in the diorama. <laughs> and I'm okay with it. You're okay with it. Fifties okay. are going good. Good. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> It's part of Maya to think you're at the other stage in the diorama. That's, mm. the, that's one of Maya's tricks. I'm probably not there. I'm probably back there at that guy <laughs> in the midlife. By the way, you mentioned that there's some things that you say every show. Yeah. There's something else that you say every show, but you haven't said it last show or this show. And people really? are watching to see if you're okay, going to we'll say see. it. We'll see. Okay. People are on the edge of their seat. Yeah. Sometimes... <laughs> Bhagavan incarnates himself or empowers, this is interesting, a suitable living being to act for him. But in either case, the purpose is the same. The Lord wants the suffering living being to go back home, back to Godhead or back out of the material universe. That's interesting. So the Lord incarnates. This book is all about the avatars or incarnations of Vishnu or empowered jivas. So we're jivas. That means we're spirit souls that have bodies that die. And an interesting side note is there's different types of jivas. Some are just bound. We're just bound up in illusion. Then there are some jivas who due to a spiritual practice, and I'm sort of guessing that's what we are here, due to a spiritual practice or a sadhana, we're trying to evolve. They're called sadhana cities. We reach our perfection. We can become perfected beings in this lifetime by a regulated sadhana. It's almost like getting training wheels. If you're in, in Europe, you know what training wheels are? Little children get those extra wheels on the back of their bicycles. We've got a bunch of Europeans here. I have to do double translations because they're listening. And they're, it's quite impressive. They're listening in their second language. Whereas Americans, they don't speak many languages. I can speak myself. I barely speak English very well. <laughs> but what was I talking about? Training wheels. Training wheels, bicycles. <laughs> what was I talking about? I don't even remember. This is Jeevas. Okay. So the Sadhana <laughs> okay. cities... Due to a, a spiritual practice, they start to develop an attachment for a spiritual life, and they can reach perfection in this life, or at least helps, helps them evolve on the ladder of their spiritual evolution. Then there are some, which are mentioned here, Nitya cities. Mm-hmm. Nitya cities means they're specially empowered by Bhagavan or divinity or God or your higher power, or sweet baby Krishna, whatever you want to call God. They're specially empowered to land on a particular planet, could be this planet, in a particular nation, 
and lead people towards some spiritual truth and help them get it back on path. But they're already liberated souls or they're empowered by Bhagavan to do such a thing. Yeah, not covered by the material energy, not influenced by it. Not influenced by the material energy. Those are called Nitya cities. Nitya cities. They're eternally liberate, in, in eternally perfect, but they're just showing up, taking a, take, coming down for a visit mm-hmm. for our benefit. Which one do you think Kostuba is? A Sana city or a Nitya city? I'm, not, I'm just a <laughs> fallen soul. <clears throat> But- See, only a Nikki City would say that. <laughs> <laughs> There's one thing that I think is really interesting here. Is this describing that Krishna? <laughs> describing that Krishna, you can't win that one. Is <laughs> describing that Krishna? He is saying that he manifests in these different forms, these different Vishnu forms, and they enter into the material realm. And we're about to read more about it, and, and on three different levels. That there's the material within the spiritual sky. There's the material realm, like a bubble, and he he enters into that. And it's said that he lies down on the water, and many universes come from his pores. And then and then it goes on to say that within every one of those universes, innumerable universes, as it was mentioning here, that he lies down again, and from him is born Lord Brahma, who is given the task to engineer the universe to kind of develop everything. And then further devas will take care of the different responsibilities in that universe. There's the water department, you have Lord Indra, there's the heating department, you have Surya, etc. That there's different devas, different empowered beings that have different universal responsibilities. You said Surya was the heating department? Yes. I like how you're breaking this. Did you say plumbing? Who did you say? <laughs> plumbing. <laughs> plumbing is Varuna. <laughs> the There's the waterworks. The water. <laughs> yeah. Just like a city, you know, it has a mayor. And then the mayor, I, sometimes they're elected. Sometimes the mayor will appoint the different right. department heads. And so Krishna is appointing different department heads. But why isn't Krishna doing it himself? You know, and, and this is th- this is a really interesting aspect of the theology that's there in the Bhagavatam, because it's saying that supreme, uh, that that ultimate deity, you could say that 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 divine source from which everything comes from, his only interest is loving adventures, loving and sweet right. loving adventures, sweet loving adventures. Me, and my 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 little five year old's turning six next week, and both me and my wife in the cab over here were saying. Six was our favorite age. As kids, yourself? As kids, we were just saying, I, I like being six. Okay. That was my favorite age. I was thinking, if you're going to be God, you may as well play. Just, you want to just be six. It's fun. You got no responsibilities, but you're sort of an independent enough to wander on your own. I don't even know where my six year old, five year old is right now. <laughs> He's wandering around here somewhere. He'll figure it out. <laughs> but, but, so- what could go wrong? It's India. <laughs> 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 but the but the point being <laughs> even when you're not interrupting me, you're interrupting me <laughs> with your ecstasies. <laughs> no, but the point being is that Krishna doesn't need to take care of it. He can appoint someone. He can expand himself and take care of it. He can appoint someone else to take care of it because he's only interested in love. And and that's where we're supposed to get. This right. is part of the bad order of religion, Kostuba. That they don't get that. Often. Well, is it, it, religion becomes fear-based. Yes. Because they think God's doing the punishing. Right. God's not interested at all in punishing. Who's doing the punishing then? He's going to appoint someone else. He's What's got, God he, doing? He's having loving adventures. Loving adventures. That's it. God, he's charming. He wears a peacock feather in his hair. Whenever you Why see him. He, pun- he doesn't punish. He's a little baby. Why would he When's want that When's the last time you're punished by a baby? <laughs> He's not only a baby. He's a That's baby. That's just how you see him. <laughs> He's a naughty, naughty boy. <laughs> He's very, very naughty. But that is that is interesting, right? And it does cut through the religious BO that you were talking about. The religious BO. That we should conceive of that supreme being. And if, and if we can conceive of him that way, that fear, we can, we can release ourselves of that fear. It's saying that we need to release ourselves from, to become these enlightened beings, attachment, fear, and anger. Right? Attachment, Just fear, and anger. Take your hands away from the camera, someone says. I already oh, did. you're good now? Oh, I'm way behind this. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah. Attachment, fear, and anger. We've got to become free of them. And it helps if we have this, I would say, a mature theology, a mature understanding of that divine being, you know? And it's beautiful also about this. It also explaining how we should understand 
different religious traditions, different spiritual practices. Why? Mm -hmm. Because enlightened people don't, it's not like uh, India's got a monopoly on God. Spiritual, spiritual sure. teachers appear all over the world mm -hmm. and they bring people towards light. Some in a very, very deep way, some in a very simple way. Um, but there's a, an, a, an, I think it just goes without saying in, in the culture of ancient India of Sanatan Dharma, Vedic teachings, it's accepted. It's not like we're going out there trying to boycott Christmas. You're right. We, 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 uh, you know, a person practicing bhakti can walk into a church, a synagogue, a mosque, a, a temple and say, how nice. People are trying to connect. Yeah. It's, it's got nothing to do with join our club, wear our costume, choose our crazy haircut. Yeah. It's not about allegiance, <laughs> right? Our advancement in, in spirituality, or you could say in yoga, isn't about allegiance. It's about the purity of our intention, right? The purity of our approach. So there's a term, sahagrahi. Right? Sahagrahi. Sahagrahi. Yeah. Sahagrahi. I sometimes said sahagrahi Vaishnava. That that when that one is looking for the essence. They're not looking at the external details. Those aren't, those aren't such a concern. That the true spiritualist. You didn't just break those. I broke them for real. <laughs> yeah, I'm back, everybody. My broken glasses. <laughs> huh. It's okay. It's gonna stay on today. Okay. I've got a second pair. But the true spirit, the true spiritualist is not so concerned with the externals, exactly how you dress, exactly what your allegiance is, exactly, you know, we pray five times a day. Well, we pray three times a day. Well, then obviously, you know, it's, it has to do with the, the, the purity, it's the essence, essentially where their heart is at, where their mind and heart are at. Mm. And, and we can see that in, in terms of the purity of, of one's approach and the purity of one's life. It would be easier if it was just, I could just buy the uh, pure devotee, pure bhakta outfit. It would be much easier. It would be easier if I just say, you tell me what to do and I'll do it. It's not that easy. You actually have to let go of the ego. No one gets a pass from this. You can join the club. You can be a high ranking official in the ashram. Yeah. You don't get a pass on shedding the ego. You might even feel, fool a few people. You might even fool lots of people. But ultimately, you get... Uh, you, you get reciprocation for what you surrender. If you yeah. surrender the ego, you will be blissful. Why? Because that, the burden of trying to impress is not there anymore. You have the peace that comes with just being connected. That's what I'm talking about, purity, right? It's not like I'm looking for whatever, prestige. Mm. It's not like I'm looking for money. Mm. It's not like I'm looking for any external thing. But I just want the real thing. You know, I just want the real thing. That's... It's the, it, that's the Sahagrahi spiritualist. That's what they're looking for. I just burped. I'm saying it now so you guys don't say it later. Like, great show, but he burped. <laughs> I'm just, I'm fessing up now. <laughs> You're an open book over here. I'm an open right book. <laughs> like Maris' phone. <laughs> right. Right, she's got no lock on her phone. If anyone doesn't know, there's no combination on her phone. <laughs> Okay, chapter three, Krishna is the source of all incarnations. Okay. By the way, mm -hmm. it's all the same and it's all different. It's all the same and it's all different. A paradox. A paradox. Please, Wrapped enlighten in us. an enigma. <laughs> <laughs> Wrapped in a mystery. And One candle lights another candle, lights another candle, lights another candle, lights another candle. Is all the flames the same? Wrong. They're all different. But they are the same. <laughs> so you're right. You're right and you're wrong. That's what it is. So now we're going to speak about all these different avatars. It's going to get into it a little bit. Let's just read, read the first few. Okay. Sutta said. So Sutta is the speaker. Sutta He's is speaking, that sage that was chosen amongst all the sages to answer the questions. Yeah. It's a child's game, Sutta says. Um, no, got that joke. Okay. Um, so he's speaking to all these sages. In the beginning of creation, the Lord expands himself in the universal form of the Purusha incarnation and manifested all the ingredients for the material creation. And, at, and thus, at first, there was the creation of the 16 principal material action, the principles of material action. This was for the purpose of creating the material universe. So before we go any further in this very confusing verse, yeah. 
Kosub, because you're so lucid and clear, why don't you please explain? Because if I, a lot of people are yoga teachers doing this, uh, listening to this, or they're familiar with yoga philosophy. Explain Purusha and Prakriti. We read about these things in the Gita and the Yoga Sutras. And a lot of people are, it's a little vague. Can you just shed some light on Purusha and pra- Prakriti and the different ways to understand that, please? If you bless me, I will try you my are best. Blessed. Um, and of course, these terms can be used in many different ways. So I'll give one way to understand them. And when we, that if we take all energy in this universe, we can divide it between spiritual and material. We can divide it in two. The spiritual energy we could call Purusha. The word Purusha means person. The word Purusha also means male. It also means the enjoyer. It has, it has different meanings. But we can, let's for now, let's just say it means conscious, spiritually conscious or person, personal energy. And then Prakriti would be material energy. And there's the difference is the Purusha is conscious and eternal. Prakriti is unconscious. And although it's eternal, but it's the forms that it takes are always shifting. So in that sense, it's temporary. It's always moving, always shifting. One is steady. One is always shifting. Now here is speaking of Lord Vishnu as the Purusha, the original Purusha, the original conscious being from which all other conscious beings extend. So here it's calling him Purusha. Mm. He's, you know, there, and this relates to the very important Upanishadic verse, Nityo Nityanam, Chaitanas Chaitananam, Eko Bahunam, Yo Vidadati Yo Vidadati Yo Vidadati Kamam, which says, amongst, amongst the many eternal beings, the Nitya, there's one. Amongst the many conscious beings, you could say the Purushas if you wanted to, there's one. The many are dependent on the one. That just like there's the sun and the sunlight, the sun, they're both eternal. They share the same qualities, but the sunlight derives its, its, its qualities from the sun. The sun is the source. And so when we're saying here the Purusha, we could call, sometimes we, the souls, are called Purusha. And then to distinguish the difference between Lord Vishnu and Lord Krishna, we would say Purusha Uttama. Mm. He's the supreme Supreme Purusha. Purusha. Right, or we might say, what are other terms? Uh, we might say, um, Adi Ish- he's the Adi Purusha. He's the original person. Govindam Adi Purusham Tamaham Bajami. We might say that even that the this we could even say, not as commonly, but the word Ishwar is generally reserved for the Lord. But sometimes we can call the living entity the Ishwar because he's the con- which means the controller. We have some control. You can control the body. I try to control my kids. <laughs> you try. <laughs> try. Yes, and that's me. when it's proved that you are not the, the, the ultimate controller. Param Ishvara, <laughs> <laughs> the supreme controller. He has no problem controlling whatever he wants to control. Now, one interesting point, and I'm saying this because I, as, as Roganath and I tried to explain in the very first show, we are not great Bhagavatam scholars. We know people who are great Bhagavatam scholars. But as I read this verse, I'm thinking something. I'm thinking we should research something. What? But did this verse remind you of anything? Any other literature out there? Any other Vedic literature? Did the verse? The verse that we just read. You know, In the beginning of the creation. Yeah, the Bible. Well, there's that. But think of Vedic. In okay. the beginning of creation, the Lord first expanded himself in the universal form. It, it reminds me yeah, of the Purusha the Shukta. The oh, Purusha oh, okay. Shukta oh, prayers. Yeah, 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 right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, this is a real important point about the Bhagavatam that we haven't even spoken about yet. And that is that the Upanishadic teachings, these important philosophical teachings, uh, were summarized in Vyasadeva himself, the author of the Vedas and the Upanishads, summarized their teachings in a collection of sutras called Vedanta Sutra. Right? Just as Patanjali summarized broader yoga teachings of Ashtanga Yoga into a and, and sutras means these terse aphorisms. Mm. So he took he took Ashtanga Yoga teachings and and um, and, and summarized them in the um, codif- codified them in the Yoga Sutras. So Vyasa David did that with the Vedic teachings in a work called the Vedanta Sutra, and a very important work. And in all the different lineages in what's called Vedanta, in all the different lineages where they study the Vedic teachings. Uh, you need to establish your lineage. A great teacher will establish that lineage by writing a commentary on the Vedanta Sutra and explain this is how it's meant to be understood. And they have to, just as a lawyer in a courtroom will have to make sound arguments based on the law books. 
a great teacher will make arguments for why this is how Vedanta Sutra is meant to be understood based on the teachings of the Upanishads, especially. And it's said that the, what comes out and what Vyasadeva himself says is that the Srimad Bhagavatam is the commentary on the Vedanta Sutra by the author himself. It's pretty cool. Right? So many, many, um, there are many lineages and they have their many commentaries on the Vedanta Sutra to establish this is how we understand things. Now, in the lineage that you and I follow, which is called the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya, from the beginning of it, it was said, we don't need a commentary on it because the Srimad Bhagavatam is the commentary on it. And look, look at the connections. And so Baladeva Vidyabhushna eventually wrote one because there was a certain demand for one. Mm -hmm. But in that, if one studies that, one can see all the connections. And there's, I, I may be wrong, but I'm sensing that this verse is connecting to the, the, the Purusha Shukta prayers, which may be summarized in the Vedanta Sutra and, and are being expanded on here in the Bhagavatam. We should look into that. I'll yeah. look into that. Yeah. Um, I can't comment on that, but I'm going. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, anyway, I can stop with that. Let's go to t text number two. Two. Okay. A part of the Purusha, or that supreme being, lies down within the water of the universe. From the navel lake of his body sprouts, from the navel lake of Hello. his body, sprouts a lotus stem. And from the lotus flower, atop of this stem, Brahma, the master of all engineers in the universe, becomes manifest. So he is the, he is the yeah. Adi, he's the original being. Sometimes it's called Aja. Aja. Yes. It's kind of like he wasn't born like everybody else. He was unborn. Aja means like unborn. So he's the unborn. He's born or the born of the lotus. Born of the lotus. And he's sitting upon the lotus coming out of the navel of Lord Vishnu. And there he's called Garbo Dakshai Vishnu. Garbo refers to the navel. It's saying here the first proof is called Karana Dakshai Vishnu. They're the two names. They can go back to Oh, the first one, yes. The first one is Karna Dakshay Vishnu. First one is Karna. That's the one lying down in the down entire in the material world. We're going to explain three major Vishnus okay. here. It gets confusing, so hold on to your, yeah. your seatbelt on. We're going to go for a ride. The, the first purush is called Karna Dakshay Vishnu. From the skin holes, listen to this, innumerable universes have sprung up. You know, do you know ever like sweat? Have anybody ever sweat here? <laughs> Is that just me? I'm sweating right now. It's hot in here. <laughs> from, from the skin holes, universes get born. The first Purusha, Karna Daksha Vishnu, from the skin holes, innumerable universes have sprung up. In each and every universe, the Purusha enters as the Garba Daksha Vishnu. So here we have a, so every like, little bead of sweat, so to speak, is a whole other universe. And then Vishnu again enters into that universe. This is the Vedic conception of creation. Yeah. He is lying within half of the universe, which is filled with water of his body. So within that universe, it's half filled with water. Right? Yep. And he's lying in it. And from the navel of this, this Vishnu, Garbhadakshita Vishnu, has sprung a stem of a lotus flower, the birthplace of Brahma, who is the father of all living beings and the master of all demigods, engineers, engaged in the perfect design and uh, working of the universal order. This answers the age-old question, what came first, the chicken or the egg? The answer is clearly stated, Lord Brahma came first. <laughs> Makes it real simple when people come after you with that one. Oh, yeah? Who or, created a chicken? Uh, where'd the chicken come from? An egg. Where'd the egg come from? A chicken. And answer that. We can. It came from Brahma. Came from the lotus. The came from a lotus. He's the original being. Yeah. Now, you might say, well, I, that, that can't be true. Why? Ant. Why ant? We got to get through our head. We're ants. Mm. Just like there's this big well at the beginning of the eco village. It's a very deep, wide well. Uh, maybe like 20 feet away. And there, for some reason or others, there must have been a pregnant frog who fell down that well. 
because it's deep, but you can see down, you see down in there. Those and those frogs live, live and die, die in that well, well for years, their whole life. The whole lifetime. And their whole life. They have no idea what a horse is. They have no idea what a pony is. They have no idea what a dog is. What to they, speak of. The, speak of. The ocean. What to speak of the ocean. Right. Can you imagine that? What is, what, all they know is what peers down that well. Yeah. A zebra has never peered down that well. An elephant has never peered down that well. Does that mean an elephant does not exist? No, they live in a well. What do they know? What do they know living in a well? In this massive universe, we are living in a well, and we think, I know everything. It's so arrogant. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> what do you think about that, Kastub? I agree. It's very arrogant. And I think... We're arrogant. It's just and, arrogant. And, and Lay on your back under the stars and tell me how great you are. <laughs> Must I? <laughs> but, but, <laughs> I'm serious. But this here's another point. Whatever your creation story is, it's going to be very far out. Even the so-called scientific one. Uh, yeah, scientific creation. Uh, all order came from an explosion. They, they, Come on. Yeah, it just, there was uh, a big peacocks, explosion. It's just everything. Uh, yeah. Uh, they all evolved. Uh, you have some things evolving in order, like a peacock, a quetzal, uh, an African elephant, a, a chimpanzee, a, uh, a, a, a field mouse. mouse. They're all coming from what <laughs> is there? Uh, Other mouses as well. What? Was They're all come from the Big Bang? Is that what you're looking for? An explosion. Explosion started yeah. creation. Yeah. Right? And, and then, well, where did the explosion come from? What set off the explosion? What's the source of the you know, explosion? So What's the source of the explosion? What's the so it came from nothing. What's the source of nothing? Yeah. Come, so, on. <laughs> come on. So What's my the, point is, I, whatever. It's just like a painting without a painter. Come on. You got a creation? Who created it? Right. It's, so it's going to be a far out story one way or another. Now, the Bhagavatam has a far out creation story. I find it to be a very interesting, theologically fascinating, and, and, and as it well as- It can't get more fascinating than the Big Bang. That's, that's, a, that's, that, that's a big leap of faith. It's a huge leap of that faith. That order came from, where do you see order coming from explosions? Anywhere. You don't see it ever happening. Light a bomb, light a bomb, light a fireworks, light an M80, throw it in a toilet. <laughs> never do it. Did you do you that? Before, you guys right? haven't all done that before? Come on. <laughs> I've never done that, Sachi, my daughter. <laughs> Don't do it. But I know people who have. You will not find order. You will find a big mess. Right. Right. But peacocks don't fly out of that toilet. And, and, and this is why when Srila Prabhupada would talk about science, he, he would say that the scientists, and, and many scientists found this as well, that the deeper they go into science, actually the deeper their conviction that there has to be some intelligence behind it. Because there's so much order. You keep finding deeper and deeper, more fascinating levels of order the deeper you go. Right? It's a, Fib it's a Fib Fibonacci spiral. It just goes on forever. <laughs> it's true. It's sacred yeah. geometry, man. So, so the Bible, Tom, when we, when we come back tomorrow, <laughs> when we come back tomorrow, we're going to be reading a bit about this, a bit more about this creation idea of Presented in the Bhagavatam. But what I suggest. We're going to talk avatars. We're going to talk avatars after that. But what I suggest is that we open up that mind. We don't be that frog in the well. Yeah. We realize that any, any creation story requires some leap of faith. Don't be a frog. That's our new t shirt. Yeah. But, but if, you, if you just take this and isolate it on its own, if you just say, hey, they say that the whole world comes from a forearm being that a, a, a lotus grows from their navel and some foreheaded being comes out and creates everything. That's insane. That's ridiculous. If you isolate that from everything else that the Bhagavatam is offering, You're right. that's, then that's that would point. seem like a huge leap. But if you take it all in context, the way you can build your faith on the rest of it and then say, okay, your teachings on, on the soul, on understanding the mind, on understanding time, sure. on, under, you know, on and on and on. They make so much sense. They fit together. It's so impressive. It's so consistent. It's so deep. It, it's bringing my mind. Then you say, okay, let's hear your creation story. We're not asking everybody to buy all this. Right. Hear it. Hear it with an open mind. Okay. Maybe it doesn't make sense. You know what? Could it make, could it happen? Yeah. Could Vishnu have forearms? Yeah. Could, it, could Brahma come from a navel and Lord Vishnu? Sure. You know why? I don't know anything. I live in a well. 
I think I know everything. I don't. And that's called humility. And humility is going to be necessary for knowledge. Yeah, and we're right. not even saying go around to oh, our bishop has four arms. Uh, Brahma came from. We don't saying say that. Just hear it. But there are things that will resonate with you. Mm. And over time, once that really locks in, like no, that this actually really practically works. I control my senses. I feel I feel I feel better about my life. Right. I control my mind. I feel more peaceful. I chant mantras. It has an effect on me. I don't even know why. It was having an effect on me. So faith is created in what? So small kirtan. increments. Okay. <laughs> you have to have an open mind to get this stuff. Let's try to have an open mind. Anyway, that's it. People listen to our podcast. Thanks for joining us. And we are here tomorrow. Everybody on Zoom now. Good to see everybody. Get that stuck. Eric Noble is jogging and listening to this. I'm feeling lazy. Thanks to everybody who put up their real faces and not their fake faces. Just a photo. A DT. Oh. oh, boy, Mara, you really know how to take the party down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good night.